I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. This innate desire for humans for certainty, right? We are yeah. really afraid of the unknown. We want to know what tomorrow is going to look like. And, and paradoxically, and I'm, I'm seeing so much of this, people tend to prefer the certainty of a worst case scenario over the uncertainty of the unknown. Like if I know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, even if it's bad, that's better than not knowing. Right. Scientists are often dealing with the uncertain. And you see this throughout history. Like often the history of science is about people getting more and more certain about a theory mm. and then some cataclysmic change happens like Einstein throws out all the old rules and conceives of a completely new concept that breaks the routine Galileo did this Newton did this and shakes up the whole scientific world yeah that's right almost all facts have a half-life we are certain of certain facts until we're not anymore it's just like the natural cycle of science it's it's that mode of falsification that's built into the scientific method, but also the ability to notice anomalies. Often in studying those outliers that we're able to discover answers that other people miss. Like if something bucks conventional wisdom, I think the instinct of most people is to say, well, okay, we're just gonna ignore that. That's just a measurement error. That's just like something that's on the edges. I'm not gonna look at that. But the people who are able to spot those anomalies, and look at them and study them and go deep on them, those are the people I think both in science and in business tend to get ahead in life. I, I love this concept of like cultivating an outside view. If you're an insider, how can you cultivate sort of an outsider brain? So excited to have the author of Think Like a Rocket Scientist, something I've always wanted to do, something I always pretend to do. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the show, Ozan Varal. How are you doing? Great. Thank you so much for having me on, James. Are you um, sheltering in place, safety in place, locking down in place? What are you doing? All of the above, all of the above. I'm here in Portland, Oregon, and we've just been quarantining for the past, I don't know, a month and a half, two months or so. Um, teaching at the law school, but we moved our classes online. So everything we're doing remotely right now. 
and you were a rocket scientist at one point. You 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 studied physics and astronomy, and you worked on in in the early O's. You worked on the Mars rover landings, and you know lots of fun rocket science stuff. And I just want to say first, your your book is great because there's no math in it. <laughs> you, you're saying think like a rocket scientist, but it's it's really you get back down to foundational principles of how one should think, how one should be a skeptic, how one really breaks through to the other side in terms of uh, achieving big, you know, thinking of big ideas that could execute into even bigger opportunities. And, and you go, you t describe stories ranging from Einstein and Elon Musk, of course, to Madonna and Steve Martin. And your, your, your storytelling is great. The, the history lessons in this book are great. Um, and again, just the, the foundational principles of thinking, I, I very much agree with. And I, and I like that the angle you take, like looking at it from the, from the point of view of a rocket scientist, by the way, I don't know if you thought about this or, or if this, if this was related to your decision of title, but there's a, um, there's a book from the chess world uh, written by in the 1950s by a Russian grandmaster, Alexander Kotov called think like a grandmaster. And he kind of also takes first principles in how to basically think like a grandmaster chess player. And it's very counterintuitive to how the average chess player thinks. So I wondered if you, Oh, I love that. Yeah. No, I hadn't heard that book before, but I'm going to add it to my list. That sounds really interesting. And there, there are some parallels actually between what he says and what you say, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into, uh, what you say in a second. I'm curious, just and again, we'll talk about Mars and all that, all that BS stuff in a second. But uh, why did you switch? You, now you're a lawyer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> why did you switch from something so esoteric and like, oh, we're gonna fly through the cosmos and dream of infinity to I'm gonna sue you? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, how did you make this incredible leap in career? Like, yeah, what happened? That, that was quite the 180. So one of the things I was an astrophysics major in in college, as you said, James, and I worked on this the 2003 Mars Exploration Rovers project. I loved working on the mission. Like everything about the mission, I loved. We did everything from design operation scenarios to help select landing sites by program stuff that was used on the rovers. But I didn't love the classes I was taking. Like the, the, the astrophysics classes I was taking were way too theoretical for me. And I've always been more interested in practical applications. Um, so I love like the thought process, the frameworks that went into thinking like a rocket scientist, but I didn't love the substance of the classes I was taking enough to go get a PhD in astrophysics. I was like a like a winemaker who loved the process of wake, making wine, but didn't particularly care about the taste. And so I took this class, it was my senior year at Cornell, it was taught by a Cornell law professor, and he taught it only for undergrads, and he used the Socratic method. So he taught it like a real law, law class would go. And I just remember sitting there, and it was like we were reading these real cases, disputes between two real people, and it felt very concrete and practical in a way that like theoretical physics was not. Uh, but one of the things I did and that led up to me writing this book was like I took the ways of thinking, the frameworks, the approaches to problem solving, the critical thinking skills, and I began applying them in law school, in academia, in the practice of law. And then later on, after I started doing speaking before corporate audiences and in businesses as well. And so I wanted to, as you said, like not write a book about the science behind rocket science, but think through ways of thinking that are easily applicable in other fields outside of astrophysics as well. Well, I, I'm fascinated by that. Uh, so, and obviously I want to cover so many topics in your, in your book, but I love the idea of taking two fields that don't seem related to each other and combining them. So for instance, uh, I had on the podcast, David Epstein, who's author of the book mm -hmm. range, which talks about, uh, breath and understanding sometimes more useful in depth. And you actually talk about that uh, a bit in, in your book. And, and by the way, the book think like a grandmaster by Alexander mm -hmm. Kotev talks about that as well. But how do you see your, so, so in, in, in David Epstein, the author of range, he was a, he studied geology, but then applied his knowledge of science to sports writing and became one of the fastest writing reporters at, at Sports Illustrated. How did you see what, what the thinking in physics, how did that apply to law? Where did you see yourself somehow 
it's almost like skipping the line in law because you're bringing in this 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 huge extra skill. Absolutely. So part of it is just critical thinking and analytical skills because law is a lot about just like problem solving. You're taking these rules and laws and applying them to different fact patterns. That's part of it. But I think what really benefited me was my ability because of my rocket science training to shift perspectives. So one of the fundamental tenets of the scientific method is that you know you create these hypotheses and then you try to actually prove yourself wrong, which is the opposite of what most of us do on a day-to-day basis. We try to seek confirming evidence as opposed to disconfirming evidence. So early on, I developed this ability because of that education and training to see perspectives, to try to beat the crap out of my own ideas, basically, right? To try to poke holes in my own thinking and come up with counter arguments to what I thought was the right answer. And that skill is invaluable in law because the best lawyers know the opposition's arguments better than the opposition does. You know, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry. I just want to interrupt a little bit because uh, Charlie Munger, who's uh, not only a, a famous billionaire investor, Warren Buffett's partner, but he also, his career is as a lawyer. That's how he started. Mm-hmm. And he has this theory that don't get into an argument with someone unless you can't argue their side of the case even better than them, which I've been applying a lot lately in my own life, particularly in all the different, you know, we live in this period right now of uncertainty with this pandemic and so on. It's very useful to be able to, again, even if it goes against all your nature, like I really believe this, if you could argue the other side really forcefully, it gives you a very almost spiritual devotion to the truth as opposed to just proving yourself right. Exactly. Then your goal becomes finding what's right and not being right. And that I think is a, is a really important shift. Um, and I don't know who coined this term, but the, it's a distinction between straw manning and steel manning. So straw manning is you know a tactic that basically you take the opposition's argument And you make it really easy to attack. You caricature it. You come up with like a weak form of the opposition's argument, which is what you see a lot in politics. And then you attack it. Okay. Can I can I I ask if something's an example? Yeah. So you might say, for example, say a politician is um, a proponent of regulating greenhouse gas emissions from cars, and then and a politician who is opposing that policy and comes out and says. Well, cars are essential to the economy, and your proposal is going to destroy the economy. Now, that's a straw man argument because the politician who's in, in favor of regulating greenhouse gas emissions, they're not saying we're going to take all the cars off the streets. We're just going to limit emissions. So that's one example of a straw man argument where you t- take the argument and make it easier to attack. I see. So what the what the politician did there was he he instead of talking about regulating green gases, he took the car side of the argument and moved it to a uh, a domain he can easily uh, you know create a catastrophe and then and then did that. So if you buy into, you know, I, I don't know. so, so I, actually tell me what, what what was the thing? How did he construct this straw man argument? So it would be so instead of sort of meeting the other politicians where he is in terms of regulating greenhouse gas emissions, he just took that argument and changed it. He said, your argument is going to destroy the economy because you're going to take all the cars off the streets, which isn't what the other politician is proposing, right? The other politician is simply saying, we need to come up with a way of limiting greenhouse gas emissions. And there's a way of doing that short of disabling transportation, uh, which is through regulation. And what what's an example that you've seen during this coronavirus, hmm. during these shutdowns and stuff? That's a good question. Nothing immediately pops to mind. Because, I mean, could it be similar that like, oh, we need to, uh, uh, you know, stop the virus by shutting down the entire economy? And then would the strawman argument be there's going to be more deaths if you shut down the entire economy? Yeah. No, I think that's 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 certainly a possibility. Um, Mm -hmm. And then so that's straw manning. And then the opposite of that is steel manning. So instead of doing that, instead of attacking the sort of the weak version of the opponent's argument, you actually steel man it, which is to create the strongest version of the opponent's argument, uh, which is what the best lawyers do, which is what Charlie Munger advocates. And then you engage with the other side. And that is is central to the scientific method. So so like in the green gases case, 
if I was taking the steel man argument, you know, maybe I would say, okay, let's say the science was hundred percent clear and, uh, cars are creating more carbon emissions. And after so many years, we're going to hit a tipping point and we won't be able to save the world from global warming right. collapse. Uh, we need, maybe I would say we need to study how long this is going to be. We need to kind of, uh, uh, understand the causes, you know, wh where, which areas of life have the strongest carbon emissions. And we can start with there, figuring out how to either regulate them or scientifically reduce those carbon emissions. So would that be like kind of a steel man yeah, argument? Exactly. Exactly. And so you, and you might say if you're still, you know, after you've summarized the opposition's argument in a way that's actually faithful to the tenets of that argument, you could say like, okay, well, here's your argument, but there are other ways of doing reducing greenhouse gas emissions that are going to, you know, do a better job. Um, if you don't want to go down this, like, let's regulate greenhouse gas emissions from cars route. Um, so, but once you once you're faithful to the opposition's argument and you steel man it, then you can come up with ways to uh, to counter it. But if you're coming up with these straw man arguments, then I think, and which is what happens in politics, so much of valuable discourse is lost. So, uh, have you ever seen the movie Eight Mile? I M &M? have. Yeah, it was a long time ago, but I've seen it. So. Um you know, Eminem is this aspiring uh, rapper and he gets in these rap battles and he keeps losing them. And then at the end, he wins the final rap battle. And I don't know if you remember, but uh, what he does in that rap battle is one of his lines is, I know everything you're going to say about me. And he starts mm -hmm. listing all the things wrong with him um, before they can list it. And, and this is a very popular sales technique too. So it's it's almost like listing the objections is the steel man technique of of sales in some way exactly and it's it's a very powerful technique in law as well like if you in your opening brief can take the sting out of all the weaknesses in your position by actually revealing them and explaining why they're not weaknesses at all you take the wind out of the sails of your opponent right and it's the same idea yep so, so like if you start your brief saying um we're here to try my client a 16 year old for murder but he did. The reality is he did murder his father. But, you know, here's some of the, here, let's go into the reasons why. So you kind of just admit guilt up front, but say, you know, maybe your argument is he shouldn't be tried as an adult or maybe it was self-defense or right. whatever, but you just admit the truth up front and then you're steel manning it. Yeah, because if you don't do that, then you lose credibility, right? Because if you, if you don't basically reveal your weaknesses and counter them up front, then you're letting your opponent just run with them. Then like, you know, the judge will open the, the opponent's brief and see all of these just soul crushing, <laughs> case destroying arguments that the judge had never heard before. If you can do that work up front, it's much more valuable. So you're saying these, you know, th this basic idea, which it kind of wrapped into, you know, to prove yourself wrong, come up with counter arguments, right. steel man the argument. Um, this aspect of critical thinking helped you with, uh, you know, understanding the law and the concepts of the law, because in order to defend your opponent, your argument is you have to be able to also attack. You have to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the prosecutor because you know they're going to attack your opponent. Exactly. That's exactly right. Did that make you better at it once you went to law school, once you got into the law? Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Because so what happens, and, and I see this in the students I teach, is like they're they're so stuck in their own perspective it becomes really hard for them to shift perspectives and see the other side's argument. And so I was able to bring in this, you know, this training I had from, from astrophysics and apply it to law in a way that I think most of my classmates at least initially struggled with, but I had the benefit of that, of that training with the scientific method. Cause you, you, you had built up that muscle. You had built up, if somebody says something, you're going to, without being overly obnoxious about it, you're going to try to come up with the opposite viewpoint and justify it. Yeah, exactly. You had that muscle built. Yep, I had the muscle built. I had done that with the scientific method, so it was just very natural for me, even though, I mean, it, it seems like these two fields are so disconnected from each other. Like, what do rocket science and law have in common? But, you know, these similarities exist not just between rocket science and law, but so many other fields as well. Like, Einstein referred to this principle as combinatory play where you take an idea from one discipline and apply it to the other 
And he called it basically that like the seed of all original thought. Um, and it doesn't seem original because it seems like, well, you're you're taking something from a different industry, a different discipline, but it's original because it's never been tried in your industry before. So one of the examples I talk about in the book is how Reed Hastings started Netflix. So he had rented, uh, I think it was the movie Apollo 13 from a blockbuster. And he like lost the movie. He got a bunch of late fees. Uh, he eventually found it. He returned it to, to Blockbuster. He was pissed off or I think he paid like 40 or 50 bucks in late fees. Hmm. And then he goes to his gym and he's like working out. And then an, and a thought occurs to him. He, he says, well, look, in this gym, I can pay 30 or 40 bucks a month and work out as much or as little as I want. Why can't I do the same thing with videos? So he took that idea and applied it to the film industry, the video industry, to create Netflix. I mean, it seems so obvious in hindsight, right? Like, of course you should be able to do that. You don't need physical stores. You don't need late fees. People should be able to have unlimited rentals if they're paying a monthly fee. But that obvious insight was missed by, by the established players in the industry and Reed Hastings, whose background was, I think he was a software developer. He was able to take this idea from from his gym and apply it to a seemingly very different industry to create this revolutionary service. What's a, what's another example? I love these types of examples. I think Johannes Gutenberg is another example of this. So he created the printing press in Europe and he had this printing press problem and he looked to other industries that were facing a similar problem. So he looked to olive oil producers who they're trying to squeeze juice out of olives. He looked to winemakers trying to squeeze juice out of grapes and he took the same mechanism and applied it to the printing press to revolutionize mass communication in europe so what was he sque he was squeezing ink out of something yeah or he was, was he? The, like the, the the way that the printing press operates is actually the that lever is very similar to how um the presses are used like to, to press the ink into paper that mechanism is very similar to the press that was used at the time to squeeze juice out of olives and, and juice out of grapes. Uh, Charles Darwin is another great example of this. Like he took, he was studying species and then he read two books. One was a geology textbook and the other was an economics textbook. The geology textbook basically argued that the changes that we're seeing in earth structure weren't due to these like catastrophic events like the Noah, you know, Noah's flood. Um, they happened gradually, the book argued, over time as like wind and erosion and rain sort of chipped away at the Earth's surface. And Darwin thought, huh, that's interesting. I wonder if the same is true for species. Like, are these changes that we're observing, uh, these differences that we're observing, did they also take place over time? Sort of similar to how the Earth structure changed. And then he read an economics textbook, which basically said that populations tend to... Um, outgrow the resources available to them, creating this competition for survival. And that was sort of the seed for like the survival of species. The, 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 the species that are best adapted to their environment tend to survive. And so he took this idea from geology and economics and applied it to biology to write on the origin of species. And there's a famous line by another biologist, I think his name is Thomas Huxley, who after he read on the origin of species said, how stupid of me not to have thought of this. Like it makes so much sense, but it makes so much sense only in hindsight. And there were so many right. people at the time who had read this economics textbook and there were people who had read this geology textbook, but it was the one person who read both the economics textbook and the geology textbook and studied species and was able to see these connections and connected dots between these seemingly very different fields. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I think... Uh... I mean, I think there's many examples in in life where this works. So for instance, you know, obviously Uber, you have taxis combined with smartphones. Mm -hmm. the, the the iPhone is, you know, MP4 players combined with, you know, phones combined with design, like all Apple computers are design combined, principles of design combined with computing. Uh, so, you know, and it's all a way to kind of, you know, take something, take a couple of ingredients that are old and well-known 
and combine them together to make a new dish. Exactly. And this is how like Steve Jobs, speaking of the iPhone, that's how he introduced the, the first iPhone. He said this is a revolutionary new device that combines a cell phone, a music player, uh, an iPod, and, and the internet into one yeah. revolutionary device. Yeah. So, all right. So, so obviously, um, you know, all these, all these things are important for rocket science. I mean, just the, na just the nature of it, you're combining explosives with flight right? <laughs> is rocket science and, you know, physics with, you know, the physics of space with the, the, the physics and the mechanics of flight, uh, you know, how flight was constructed. So it's the, the whole field kind of developed and which is all, physics also combines astronomy with, uh, you know, math essentially. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Like astronomy is basically applied physics and, and all of these concepts from different fields just creep into what you're doing. You know, I always wondered why do you need, you know, why did, why didn't they think from the beginning that just making a faster plane could get them into space? Why, why do we need like a, a basically a, a nuclear strength bomb to send something into space? And I understand you need to be going like 17,000 miles a second to break free, but is that true? Well, you need, you need to reach escape velocity. Um, and so, so yeah, so that, that is why you can't just do, do it with a, with a faster plane. Um, and so, and, and, you know, and that was the, like the design of a rocket basically. Um, and, and, and some of the ideas from combinatory play also come into play when it comes to like space missions. Um, not just in like, in terms of how physics is taught in the classroom, but you know, the, the example that popped to mind when you talked about, um, combinatory play in rocket science was like, we used airbags to land on Mars, um, the the rover that we had built, two rovers that we sent to Mars in 2003, were cocooned in these airbags, and it's the same type of airbag that cushions your collision with the steering wheel. And we took that and and applied it to to our rovers to be able to land on Mars. What what was made first, the airbag or the rovers? That is, no, I think the airbag was made first, definitely. Um, and what about the lunar rovers? Were they in uh, airbags? That's a good question. I don't know if the airbags were used in the lunar landings. I don't remember. Um, I think some form of them may have been used. But, you know, at the time when we were talking about or when we were initially designing our rovers to send to Mars, they were going to use these three-legged landers to land on the Martian surface. Um, and this was in 1999. It's actually a great story that I talk about in the book. But the another spacecraft that year the called the mars polar lander crashed and they were going to use the same landing mechanism that we were planning to use so our mission was scrapped and suspended mm -hmm. and uh and we were thinking about what to do and, and sort of come up with a different way of landing on mars and until a jpl engineer by the name of mark adler came up with the idea of using airbags and he said why don't we just put airbags on this thing and I mean, it looks so crude when you look at these. They're like giant white grapes. And you cocoon the rover in this thing, and then you launch it onto, into Mars. And then, you know, you have a parachute and, and rockets that slow down the landing. And then the thing drops, and it bounces like 30, 35 times before coming to a rest. And it's like, wow. oh, you've got this delicate ro rover inside. How is that going to work? I mean, we, we tested the crap out of it, of course. But it had worked before in the Pathfinder mission, and that was back in 1997. And and then you know NASA got a little bit more, I think, sexy with its sort of like landing systems and tried using this this three like a lander. Um, but like we went back to what we were doing because it had worked before, and then we landed safely on the Martian surface because we relied on this like seemingly primitive technology airbags, but it had worked before. So we knew it could work again. And that's the technology we relied on to get two rovers onto the Martian surface in 2003. So I like this uh, one quote that you, you say in the book, rocket scientists imagine the unimaginable and solve the unsolvable. And a lot of your book is, or a lot of the early parts of the book are about how scientists are often dealing with the uncertain. And, and you see this throughout history. Like all, all, often the history of science is about people getting more and more certain about a theory mm -hmm. and then some cataclysmic change happens. Like Einstein throws out all the old rules and invents or, or, you know, conceives of a completely new concept that, that, 
that breaks the routine. Galileo did this, Newton did this, and and shakes up the whole scientific world. Yeah, that's right. And I think it's it goes back to what we were talking about before too with respect to falsification. Like we are almost all facts have a half life. We are certain of certain facts until we're not anymore. Like we're we're certain that something is true. We were certain for so long that Newton's laws controlled basically described behavior everywhere in the universe until Einstein came along. And and uh, he noticed an, an anomaly in Mercury's orbit and came up with the theory of relativity. Uh, and then Einstein's ideas broke down at the quantum level. Um, and so science as a way, it's just like the natural cycle of science. It's it's that mode of falsification that's built into into the scientific method, but also the 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 ability to notice anomalies, and which I think is applicable to the business world as well, to academia. Um, Einstein noticed an anomaly in Mercury's orbit that a lot of people had sort of dismissed. They said, "Well, you know, Newton's laws describe behavior, describe motion accurately everywhere else in the universe. Why bother about Mercury? Why bother about this outlier?" But it's often in studying those outliers that we're able to discover answers that other people miss. Like if something bucks conventional wisdom, I think the instinct of most people is to say, well, okay, we're just going to ignore that. That's just a measurement error. That's just like something that's on the edges. I'm not going to look at that. But the people who are able to spot those anomalies and look at them and study them and go deep on them, those are the people I think both in science and in business tend to get it, get ahead in life. So, you know, and it's hard to do yeah. because for instance, let's say, you know, and, and Einstein had a lot of things going for him that didn't seem like they were going for him. Like, you know, he, he wasn't working in a university. In right. fact, he'd been rejected for jobs at a university. He was working just in the, uh, whatever the Swiss patent office. And so he was kind of outside the mainstream and maybe that allowed him to kind of look at a, a problem. He, he didn't have all the professors down the hall that could quote unquote, explain to him why this is not a problem. He had to figure it out himself. And so he noticed an, it's an anomaly and, and he worked on it in a different, from a different angle. Yeah, no, definitely. That was a huge advantage. So being an outsider allows you to see things that the insiders miss, um, which is why I think, so expertise is really valuable, but experts shouldn't work in isolation. Revolutionary ideas often tend to come from people outside the industry we already mentioned an example of Reed Hastings, right? He was a software developer when he disrupted the the movie delivery business. But the same is true for Jeff Bezos. Like Jeff Bezos was in finance before he started, you know, Amazon, which was a book selling company initially. Um, Elon Musk. What, yeah, Elon Musk I was about to say. Yeah, Elon Musk is another example of this, right? He was in Silicon Valley. He founded PayPal, and then at the you know the moment he sold PayPal to to eBay. He was on a beach in Rio uh, reading a book, but his idea of beach reading was the fundamentals of rocket propulsion. You know, he's, he's sort of on his way from becoming the Silicon Valley guy to becoming the rocket guy. And all of these people were able to see things, to spot anomalies that the insiders had missed. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. 
This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. How can you cultivate, I think this is a very powerful thing. Like how can you cultivate that outsiderness if you're not an outsider? So let's say Elon Musk had studied physics and rocket science all his life. But, but, you know, I think kind of the innovation in thinking that he had was that I don't need to be a government. I can figure out, you, you know, using, you know, the best, you know, surround my, surrounding myself with the best minds, but, and also doing a lot of self-study. I can figure out a way better than the government to put a rocket in space 
using, you know, first principles. So if he hadn't been an outsider, I doubt he would have been able to think that way. He would have yeah. said, look, NASA's, this is, you're talking about a trillion dollars. NASA's done all the work. We kind of have to, what are you going to do? Start from scratch? Like, so I think if he was an insider, he wouldn't have been able to think that way. But maybe if you're an insider, how can you cultivate sort of an outsider brain? I think there are two things you can do. Uh, the first and probably the obvious answer, but it's a, I think it's a good, good answer, is to bring outsiders into the conversation. And this doesn't have to be an expensive consultant um, or expensive outside speaker. It could be as simple as asking a friend who knows nothing about what you're talking about for their input. Uh, it could be mm. bringing in you know, someone who's in a different division or working on a different project in your company to come in and ask you those quote unquote dumb questions that are actually not dumb at all because they go to some like fundamental basis of the problem that you're probably missing. Um, and so amateurs are tend to, tend to get dismissed or they don't know what they're talking about, but amateurs tend to ask the best questions. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is like the, the first Harry Potter book. Um, it was rejected by, I think, a dozen publishers until it landed on the desk of Nigel Newton, who's the head of Bloomsbury Publishing in the UK. And, and Newton saw a promise in the book where other publishers had missed it. And his secret was his eight-year-old bookworm daughter, Alice. He took the first chapter of the book home. He gave it to Alice. And he's like, tell me what you think. Alice took it, took the book to her room, devoured it, came back down and said, dad, this is so much better than anything I've read. Mm. And that input from an eight-year-old convinced her father to write a meager 2,500 pound check to JK Rowling, which is probably one of the best bets <laughs> made in publishing, publishing history, all because Newton was willing to step outside of his bubble and get the input of somebody who is an outsider to the publishing industry, but a member of the target audience for the book. So from a legal point of view, from a, for a lawyer, let's say I have a complicated, or let's say what I have, I'm defending someone for murder and it seems cut and dry the case against them. You know, would it one technique be to just ask some, you know, a random person like, Hey, here's the case. Here's all the things I, I have some nagging feeling about this, but I don't know what, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a great start. And we used to do this all the time at, at the law firm. I used to work in, in San Francisco. Um, We'd run things by other lawyers. You know, if you're working on an antitrust case, go talk to a, a lawyer who does breach of contract work and get their input on your case. Even though they know nothing about antitrust law, they'll be able to spot arguments. And it, you know, goes back to combinatory play too. They might be able to take things from breach of contract and apply them to antitrust, but you're not going to know what those ideas are unless you have that cross-pollination that happens when you bring in an outsider to the conversation. I, I love this concept of like cultivating like an outside view. Like if you think about your own research into rocket science, you mentioned how you didn't really enjoy the math part, but you love the, you know, the concepts and exploring them. And I do feel like in the study of physics, there's this disconnect where you can discuss very high level ideas without necessarily explaining the the math behind every idea so so people who are amateurs can discuss relativity and quantum mechanics and even come up with ideas you know about quantum mechanics because there's so many just crazy ideas about it you you could be an amateur and come up with just as good ideas and you don't always have to understand all of the math underneath yeah, exactly like you you don't have to be which is the whole reason i wrote the book is you don't have to be a rocket scientist to think like one um and there are a lot of examples in the book when it comes to like the discovery of planets where you have these like people who are doing astronomy on the side. They have a homemade telescope in their backyard and they're the ones who are discovering planets that astronomers miss. Um, so I think, I mean, I, and I hope that's inspiring for people because we tend to put not just rocket scientists, but just fill in the blank in a, on a pedestal and, and assume that they sort of have this genius that, that the rest of us lack but, you know, geniuses and experts have, there are certainly advantages to it, but they have a huge, huge disadvantage, which is they are so attuned to conventional wisdom. They are so attuned to what's worked in the past 
that they tend to develop tunnel vision. And they're often not able to see novel insights, which is why you see so many of these established companies getting disrupted by these like scrappy startups who are complete outsiders to their world because they're able to see things that the experts miss. Well, you know, it's it's an interesting thing right now because it's, uh, you know, a lot of these discussions and arguments, and I, I don't mean to talk too much about this pandemic because this, this podcast is going to live a lot longer than this pandemic, hopefully, but there's a lot of expert bias. So, so if, if you say something and you have an opinion and you've really thought about it and, and studied the models and read the papers, people will say, this is a common response I get, Hey, I'm going to leave this to the experts. Why don't you go back to doing your thing and let the experts do their thing. And now it's turned out so many of the expert theories have either been wrong or first they're wrong, then they're right, then they're wrong. And we don't know, there's so much uncertainty, but leaving things like we're, we're in an area of complete uncertainty. There's nobody really an expert. And I don't know, I just, I find this kind of thinking very important right now. I agree completely. I think especially so because expertise has become a self-proclaimed qualification. Like people become experts yeah. just by calling themselves that. Um, that's part of it. Which on the one hand is what Elon Musk did a little bit. He, yeah. I mean, he never called himself an expert, but he did become an expert in maybe not necessarily the math, but he he, he was able to learn enough about building rockets that he was able to ask the right questions to 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 the experts. Exactly, exactly. And so, and, and, and the thing that I think, so I, I'm not railing against, amateurs can certainly become experts. There's nothing wrong with that. I think I think what I'm concerned about is people who are proclaiming themselves to be experts based on little more than like two minutes of Wikipedia knowledge on something and then mm -hmm. making wildly reckless predictions to inject some sense of certainty into this very uncertain environment that we're operating in. And then people are, you know, there are, people are anxious, right? People are suffering emotionally. So then they're looking for certainty. They're looking for confident conclusions, which these experts are providing. Now, those conclusions, many of them are going to turn out to be wrong, completely wrong. Um, and, and here's the problem from my perspective. Like when experts, quote unquote experts, like self-proclaimed experts, make these confident conclusions that turn out to be wrong, nothing happens to them. Like nobody says, you know what, Dr. Stu, you know, eight of your last 10 predictions were totally wrong. So we're going to bench you for a little bit. Like that doesn't happen. People forget about them and move on. So you're seeing the same experts sort of make the same, you know, types of predictions on on TV and and nothing happens to them. And so, you know, which is one of the reasons why I don't really read the news anymore. Like I'll scan the headlines yeah. very quickly, but I don't go into detail just because it's like so much of what we're seeing in the news right now about what the future is going to look like six months from now is just inaccurate. We just don't know. It's it's so right. Like you could turn on a business channel and, you know, a common topic right now will be, well, what do you predict for the quote unquote new normal? And somebody will say, you know, movie th theaters won't exist. Another person will say movie theaters are going to boom. Yeah. And really the correct answer is there's no way for us to know right now. And we just don't know. Exactly. But, but they are, they are jumping in to fill in this, like this innate desire for humans for certainty, right? We are yes. really afraid of the unknown. We want to know what tomorrow is going to look like. And, and paradoxically, and I'm, I'm seeing so much of this, people tend to prefer the certainty of a worst case scenario over the uncertainty of the unknown. Like if I know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, even if it's bad, that's better than not knowing. Right. Uh, I mean, this is obvious in the stock market where yeah. It doesn't even matter good news or bad news. It's it's the stock market is really a measure of the psychological level of uncertainty versus certainty in the world. And like because like right now all we get is bad news. But I haven't looked at the market today. We had three million more uh, people file for unemployment. That's bad news. But I'm even willing to bet that there's a reasonable chance the stock market's up. Uh, uh, so let me just take a look right now. Yeah, stock market's one and a half percent up. So. Um, it's just interesting. So, so, but, but yeah, dealing with uncertainty is a big part of your book. Like how does one, how does one handle that? Cause again, in order to be, in order to get, to break through the people who say, oh, we've always done it this way. You have to be able to, to 
function and even thrive in a world of uncertainty. Exactly. So I think the first step is to realize that all progress happens in uncertain conditions. So if you look at the history of science, this isn't just true for science, but it's true for business as well. Progress is almost always preceded by uncertainty. Like somebody notices something that's unknown or uncertain, they spot an anomaly, something's off, and then they decide to delve deeper into that. That is that is the genesis of of all breakthroughs, um, but then it runs up against this very human conditioning against uncertainty. I mean, primarily because like our ancestors who were not afraid of the unknown didn't live long enough to pass their genes right. on to us, right? They were eaten by a saber toothed tiger. Um, but then you know you carry that conditioning into the modern world, and it creates this dynamic where we're afraid of uncertainty. And by the way, so what happens in uncertainty is all decision making stops. This is true for people. This is true for businesses. The status quo becomes really sticky because we're afraid of what's going to happen next. So either the status quo becomes sticky or people start copying each other. So when you have unnerving uncertainty, we assume that other people know something that we don't. So we start copying them. Uh, great example of this, if you look at your inbox and... You know, if if it's anything like mine, the tens of messages, the dozens of messages that landed in your inbox from different companies over the past two months saying the exact same thing, right? A special message from our CEO to our valued customer about our response to COVID. People are doing the exact same thing. It's copy and paste. Um, so how do you deal with that? How do you progress and move forward in the face of face of uncertainty? So one of the strategies that's been And how do you lean in? How yeah, do you how do you lean, lean into it? it? Exactly. Um, so one way is, and these are, you know, take what works for you and, and leave what doesn't. One way that I've done this is to just become curious about tomorrow. Instead of yearning for certainty about what tomorrow is going to look like, just embrace the unknown and become curious. Like, I wonder what's going to happen tomorrow. I wonder if movie theaters are going to be open in, in six months, but without actually grasping for certainty. And then mm. if you're if you're looking for if you're looking to pivot or start something new in this time period, uh, I love this analogy, and I don't know who in, initially came up with this. May have been Jeff Bezos or somebody else, but the distinction between one way doors and two way doors. So one way door, we assume most of our decisions in life are one way doors. So you open this door into the unknown, you take a new job, you move to a new city, and there is no turning back, right? And if things don't work out as you hoped, life as you know it comes to an end. That turns out to be a faulty assumption in most cases. Like most decisions in life come with two-way doors, not one-way doors. You can walk in to the unknown, uh, have a look around, see what it's like. And if you don't like it, you can always move back out. And so I applied this principle, although I wasn't calling it that, back when I was practicing law and thinking about going into into academia. Like I wasn't satisfied with thinking of my life in these six minute billable increments. And just the, the practice of law wasn't satisfying me in a way that I think academia, I thought academia might. Um, and so I took this temporary teaching job in Chicago for two years. And as I was leaving though, I thought to myself, you know, this is a this is basically a two-way door. If I don't like academia, I can always go back to the practice of law. I mean, I was doing great work at the firm I was at. They'd probably take me back. But even if they didn't, some other firm would. It's not a one-way door. And that, I think, should reduce the, the threshold required for, for entry is, is to come up with a way of framing decisions or, or, or come up with a way of actually creating sometimes a doorknob on the other side so you can come out if you don't like what you see. So, so how is this? So I guess what you're saying is you can make a decision where the outcome's uncertain, yeah. but you know that you can fall back. You have a buffer you can fall back on. You have a, you have a plan B that's not so bad. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I wonder though, what about uncertainty? Like, you know, a lot of people are legitimately afraid three months from now, will my job exist? Mm. And you know, that uncertainty always exists in life, but now it's more pronounced. So how do people who are, unused to dealing with uncertainty or this level, how do they suddenly deal with, hey, we've got an enormous uncertainty happening right now? Right. So I think two questions are really helpful to ask. One is, how do I 
solve the problems that the world needs solving right now as opposed to the problems that I expect it to solve. You know, if the pandemic rendered your or might render your your business, the services you provide obsolete, think about how those skills, resources, and services could be used in ways that you haven't used them before. Because here's the thing, like human beings are really afraid of uncertainty, but we're also really adaptable if we're asking ourselves the right questions. Um, so I had to do this with you know, my book launched on April 14th. I had this big book tour planned. It was canceled. Uh, hmm. And I spent two days being very miserable uh, and trying to sort of like wish that reality were were different than it was, and which is a really unproductive exercise, right? Like trying to change, trying to control what can't be controlled is useless. So I went back and... <laughs> thought like a rocket scientist and asked myself, okay, well, the book tour isn't happening, uh, but what else can I do to get the word out? And what other like probably more creative ways can I come up with to get the word out about my book? So I ended up doing a bunch of virtual events with other authors who are in similar positions, and I probably reached audiences that I otherwise would not have reached through a normal physical book tour. And I also realized going through this that if you apply first principles thinking and question assumptions, that a book tour is probably not the best way to like spread yeah. the word about about your book, right? And like, if I'm being honest with myself, I was signing up to do this book tour primarily because I'm like, this is what authors do, right? You write a, a mainstream book, and this is my debut nonfiction mainstream book. You go on a book tour. But I wasn't reasoning from per first principles. I wasn't asking myself, well, wait a second. If my goal is to reach as many people as possible with this message, is a book tour where I have to get on a plane and fly to New York and go to some bookstore and you know and sign books for an hour or two. Is that really the best way to get the word out about the book? And the answer is no. And so Yeah, the answer is totally yeah. no for obvious reasons because everyone's showing up you know, people are busy, right? right? So if someone is showing up for your book tour in New York City, it's because they specifically wanted, they already were a likely buyer of your book. Second, if you speak at a Barnes & Noble in New York City, who's going to be there? 80 people are going to be there, tops, exactly. 100 people, probably more like 20 people. You're on a podcast like this, you're going to reach hundreds of thousands of people. So I never understood why, the only reason authors, I think, go on a book tour as opposed to, let's say, a podcast tour is because you're hitting, the, the booksellers know the, Book, specific bookstores that the New York Times mm. bestseller list right. uses to measure bestsellers. So that now is out the window, but that was the main reason for a book tour, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and so uh, if you're experiencing similar shifts in your life, just realize that what's sometimes like when, the, when you're forced out of the status quo, uh, in some cases that can be a good thing because the status quo might be based on outdated conventional wisdom that should have been questioned and thrown out anyway, as in the case of a book tour. Yeah, so I'm still, so okay, so so uncertainty, like let's say uh, I decided I have a, let's say I'm a lawyer or I'm a paralegal at a law firm and I'd love to start my own internet company. Hmm. And let's say I have no computer experience, never started a company. Um, so it's, I have a, A, I'm an outsider and B, I have a lot of uncertainty about you know, what kind of company can I, I can start? Uh, so I'm starting top down. I'm not starting bottom up. So bottom up would be, oh, I see a problem. I can't get a car when I want to. So I'm going to start Uber. So top down in this case would be, I'd like to be an entrepreneur, but I don't know where to start. How would they, how would that person lean into uncertainty? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the breakthrough products happen in that bottom up perspective where you Find yeah. a problem, right, and then and then you work your way up. If you're approaching it from from top down, it's it's hard, um, and it's hard because you don't know what the market needs. You know, you might be curious about something, but you don't know if there's a need for that in the market. Right, it's hard to know where the anomaly is if you don't really know the 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 sector that you're you want to develop your company. Yeah, in. exactly. And so if you're, I mean, if you find yourself in that position, I would first of all encourage you to go bottom up. Bottom the, from from bottom up, but if if you are approaching it from top down, I think it's really important to just conduct limited experiments and so try something out. <clears throat> you know, don't completely quit if you're a lawyer. Don't just quit your job and and become an entrepreneur overnight and and try to do that thing. Just start something on the side and 
and you know, just follow your curiosity. But ideally, you're going to find something, or you should find something that you're curious about, that you're interested in exploring, but whether where there's also a need for it in the market, right? It's that like that intersection of that. If you're thinking of this in terms of a Venn diagram, the intersection of those two circles between your curiosity and what the market needs is gonna be the is gonna be the sweet spot. Um, so experimentation is really important. Conducting these. You can place these small bets on the side, uh, and you don't need all of these to take off, right? If if one of them takes off, it compensates for the dozens and dozens of things that don't end up working. Um, and then one other idea goes back to combinatory play, but I think it's good for dealing with uncertainty as well, is to diversify your identity. Man, I, I have I have to tell you by the way, almost everything we're talking about, I just finished writing about in a book also. Oh, that's awesome. But in a, in, in a different way than, than you did. I'm, I'm looking at from the angle of if you switch careers and interests, how you can quickly skip the line to be in the top 1% of that field. Mm. And so a lot of it is, you know, this idea of, I call, I have different names for it, but like this idea of combinatory play, like you were able to probably skip the line in, in the legal world because you're bringing in this whole physics right. knowledge. And in terms of happiness, often you know, you need to dive in sort of this primal tribal way. You need to diversify the hierarchies you're in. Mm-hmm. Cause if you're trying to get a promotion at work and you don't, it's it, but if you can be the champion at the local tennis club, that's a way to diversify hierarchies to keep your, your well being going, even while you're experiencing frustration. Yeah, I agree completely. And so that's one of the things that I've tried to do in my life is like, I, you know, I'm a tenured law professor. I have a blog, I have a podcast, I write books. Um, I do a lot of corporate speaking and, and, you know, not only does that allow me to combine ideas from very different fields. And by the way, my corporate speaking also exposes me to different industries that I know nothing about. Like I talk to pharmaceutical companies and I talk to the HR world. Um, but also it means that I'm, it's, it becomes easier for me when one of those things goes away. So like I can shut down my podcast tomorrow, um, if the the pandemic stopped most of my speaking engagements, uh, but I can lean on the other areas, right? Because I'm not depending on only on one of those as a source of income, but also as a source of fulfillment. You know, what, one of the reasons why failure hits us hard is because when you're so invested in the one thing you're doing, when it, if the only thing you are is a lawyer, if that is your entire identity, and then you're passed up for a partner. That's devastating, but in, you know. But if you've diversified your identity, like in my life, if things aren't going well, say in the speaking realm, uh, I can lean into the other areas, right? I can lean into my podcast, or I can lean into my blog, and that becomes, I think, much easier for for you to to deal with failure and and find ways of basically like mitigating the hit that your ego takes when you fail. If you're diversified, your identity. Uh, if you're if you're failing in one area, you might be succeeding in the other, as you said. Yeah. So it's 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 interesting because, uh, I mean, I diversify my identity, as you put it, so much that when I'm on other podcasts, people don't even know how to introduce me <laughs> because there's no one thing yeah. I do, and it's great because you could be in with some subculture where you're, you know. I don't know how, like combining subcultures is very interesting too, where you're like known in one subculture and it's kind of unusual, let's say if you're in a law firm, but you're also known in, I don't know, the tattoo subculture, that would be an interesting combination of of hierarchies. Totally. And it makes you a more interesting person, right? Like, like James, you write books, you have a podcast, but you also do comedy uh, yeah. and, and you write TV shows. And so it, and I think it just makes you a more like it's, I think far more interesting to talk to you at a cocktail party than someone who does podcasting full time. Although usually people don't like my breath and they walk <laughs> away and it's all embarrassing. They talk to each other about me. And, uh, but, uh, so when you said first principles thinking, I always wonder about this. Like Eric Weinstein talks about this as well. How do you define first principles? So first principles thinking is a way of questioning assumptions. So breaking down a, complex system into its subcomponents. So non-negotiable raw materials. Um, 
And the analogy I use in the book is like copying or reasoning by analogy, is, which is the opposite of first principles thinking, is like being a cover band. You take somebody else's songs and you might introduce your own twist or your own variation to them, but you're, you're basically doing what somebody else has done before. Whereas first principles thinking requires you to do the, the painstaking work of becoming an original artist, writing a new song from, from scratch. So questioning all assumptions, it's, it's like hacking through a, a jungle with a machete, basically, to get rid of all of the weeds and everything in there to, to get to the, the fundamental raw materials. Uh, the example I gave in the book, book is from Elon Musk and how he started SpaceX. When he first was thinking about sending a rocket to, to Mars, he was shopping for rockets that other people had built. And they were way too expensive. He looked in the American market. Right, it was like $120 yeah, million. Dollars exactly, $120 million. And then he went to Russia and he was shopping for uh, decommissioned intercontinental ballistic missiles without the, the, the nuclear warheads on top. And even those were too expensive. And on his way back from Russia, from one of these shopping sprees empty-handed, he had an epiphany. Uh, and he arrived at that epiphany by using first principles thinking. He asked himself, wait a minute, like, what, is it, what is a rocket actually made of? And the raw materials that he came up with, like titanium, carbon fiber, if you look at the raw materials and the cost of those raw materials on the market, it was like 2% of the typical price of a rocket. So he just said, well, I'll just build my rockets from scratch. Like Instead of trying to buy rockets that other people have built, I'll just build them myself. It will be so much cheaper. Um, and the other thing he did was to question another deeply held assumption in rocket science using first principles thinking, which is reusability. So for decades, rockets that were sent into outer space couldn't be reused. They would burn up in the atmosphere or like fall into the ocean, requiring a new rocket to be rebuilt again. I mean, imagine for a moment doing that for commercial flights. Like you fly from Portland to New York City, after the passengers deplane, somebody steps up to the plane and just torches it. That's basically what we did for rockets. And the price of a rocket, if you're building it right, isn't actually that much more expensive than a Boeing 737, but commercial flights are so much cheaper because you can use airplanes over and over and over again. And, and so both SpaceX, Elon Musk's company, and Jeff Bezos' company, Blue Origin, are, have questioned that assumption and, and now have created so many of these reusable rocket stages, they keep refurbishing and sending them back out to outer space like certified pre-owned vehicles. And that's been, that's been a, 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 a product of first principles thinking. So, so let me ask you this, like even dating back to like the Mercury program, which sent, you know, the first humans from the U S into space, why didn't they just, uh, uh, build heat shields around you know, the way they have heat shields in there when they land to protect them as they're going back into the atmosphere. Why don't they build heat shields around their, you know, booster rockets that they would, you know, basically use once and that's it. So they did this to some extent with the space shuttle. Uh, the space shuttle was partially reusable, uh, but the space shuttle was such a complicated machine that like refurbishing the, the reusable parts to try to get them for reuse required like millions of procedures and it cost more than building a new space shuttle from scratch. Mm. So the case against reusability was based on the space shuttle. So if you're if you're simply copying and pasting like what NASA has done, you would say reusability is a terrible idea. Like it didn't work for the space shuttle. I mean it worked in the sense that it was partially reusable, but it was so expensive that it wasn't worth it. You would conclude it was a bad idea. But if you're using first principles thinking, you might say, well, no, it was a bad idea because of how complicated the space shuttle was. But if you can create a simpler rocket uh, that can be reused quickly and completely, then the cost problem goes away. And the economic case for reusability makes a lot more sense. Hmm. So, all right, so, so tell, me, tell me more. I want to think like a rocket scientist. So one other, one other uh, I think principle is the rocket science approach to failure. Um, and failure, I think... Oh, uh, yeah, you discussed this in part three of your book. Yeah, failure is, is all the rage these days. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley especially has that fail fast, I, fail forward mantra. Yeah, I know. I, I call it failure porn because I almost feel like 
you were for many years you weren't allowed to admit failure right. but now it's like considered a badge of honor to say oh i failed at my first company so you should put money into my second company now totally which is which is a bad idea by the way for the reasons yes. that i'll get to, into just a second i think the pendulum has now swung in the complete opposite direction we're now fetishizing failure and celebrating failure to a dangerous extent there are like conferences yes. dedicated to celebrating failure S silicon valley companies are now holding funerals for startups failed startups complete with like bagpipes and djs and like oh, really? yeah, sponsorships by liquor Ugh. companies like alcohol flowing freely this and and i don't buy it i don't buy it for two reasons like one is regardless of what silicon valley tells you failure sucks and whoever yes. says like they celebrate failure and they don't mind failing is lying to you um that's number one number two is when you're celebrating something, you're not learning from it. And this is my problem with the fail fast mantra, is just because you're failing fast, moving from one failure to the next, doesn't mean you're actually learning. And research actually shows that you people don't learn from their failures. I cite a study in the book, it was uh, 6,500 cardiac surgeons, they tracked them over a 10 year period. And they found out that the surgeons who botched procedures performed worse on later procedures. Not the same, not better, but worse. Not only did they not learn from their mistakes, but they actually ended up reinforcing bad habits. So, so I'm, I'm going to just take a guess, which is that, because you used the word experiment earlier, and I, I like that word a lot in terms of learning, mm -hmm. that you know, in a, in a surgery, the stakes are very high. Right. So, so if you admit that you made a mistake, then you might have killed, then you're admitting you killed somebody. Mm -hmm. But if you say, oh, I did what I always do and he died, you're gonna have you're gonna want to confirm your bias that to do another surgery the same way and have the person live. Exactly. So then you can say it's not called. But if like if you're Thomas Edison and and you're doing, you know, you're trying to make a, 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 a actually the real story is he was making a, a battery. If you try if you fail if quote unquote fail 9,999 times, you can easily say, well, I didn't fail that many times. I, I, there, there were 9,999 times I learned how not to make a battery. So the stakes weren't as high with each time. So it could be more, you know, an experiment, as you pointed out earlier in, in a roundabout way is, uh, uh, there's little downside, but huge upside right. if it works. Exactly. And the debt, and there's not even really downside. The only downside is that you didn't finish, but you learned something. Right. So, so experiments you can't fail but but uh failure is almost like an experiment with with the stakes too high yeah that's right um and i think you know hopefully you're learning from your experiments uh, but not necessarily right. right and so like another study in the book is about entrepreneurs and going back to your question about like i failed in business before invest in my company it the research shows that people who failed in business before are basically no more successful than first time entrepreneurs uh, because they don't, what happens is when we fail, it our ego has hit so hard, especially if you haven't diversified your identity, is that you tend to blame the failure on external factors. You don't say, right. I made a mistake. You don't say, I made a bad decision. You blame the competitors. You blame the regulators. You come up with excuses like, oh, if only we had more cash flow, things would have turned out differently. So then you're going from one failure to the next, basically doing the exact same thing you did before, but hoping that the wind blows in a better direction. Right. And I think I think the solution for that a little bit that is is what what uh, Jocko Willing calls uh, extreme ownership. Mm -hmm. So no matter how big the failure is, and people try to make you feel better, like oh that's just the way it happened, blah blah. blah. If you always just say nope, it's my fault. Like I ha I have to take ownership of this. Then I think that helps turn a failure into a learning experience or, or an experiment into one. Exactly. So you know if if you properly construct the experiment, just like a scientist would, then you can take it's a e little easier to take extreme ownership. With failure, I think it's a little harder because there's so much of your personality wrapped up into a startup or a, a, you know again a, a surgery something with high stakes. But if you always take this view that uh, a first principle is I did, I did this action. So I have to own it. I have to own every aspect of it. Then I think it's easy to remind yourself to learn from it. Absolutely. 
And and the mantra should be to learn fast, not to fail fast. Um, and the same idea yeah. applies to success too. By the way, I think we should be conducting post mortems after successes as well, not just after failures, because it's possible. Totally agree. Because yeah, it's possible Go for ahead. bad decisions to generate good outcomes. That's called luck. Yes. Yeah, like that happens a lot in like poker. Mm -hmm. You could play like the worst hand in the world and win, and then you think to yourself, "Oh, I'm a great poker player." But the reality is over time, you're going to lose all your money. And then the same thing happened. I mean, I know it happened with me with investing. In, I started investing in 1998 uh, in internet stocks. Guess what? I was a genius. <laughs> and then starting in 2000, I can't, I can't understand this. I'm a genius and I'm losing so much money. So, uh, you know, avoiding the, you know, doing, doing a postmortem would have helped me to see it would have helped me to learn a little bit more about investing before I went full force into investing. Exactly. And and the same problem, by the way, was at the heart of the, the Challenger in Columbia, space shuttle disasters as well. Um, NASA- And, and even the postmortems on those. Yeah, and NASA had, a, exactly, even the postmortems on those. NASA had a series of, a string of successes leading up to both launches that basically convinced them that they could do no wrong. Like if they were simply doing what they did yesterday with with regard to the Challenger, the culprit turned out to be these O-rings, which are like these flexible rubber bands that seal the um, the solid rocket boosters and prevent hot gases from escaping. NASA had been flying uh, space shuttles with damaged O-rings for years. And in each of those missions, they were characterized as successes because nothing bad happened. Uh, and and the engineers who raised their hands and said, you know what? Like we're seeing a lot of damage on the O-rings. There might come a time where the O-ring, both the primary and the secondary, fail, and the mission is ends up being a failure. Right? You end up with a catastrophe. But the managers ignored it because they were, they became too complacent with success. But then I wonder, you know, how much of this? And and I know this is a a, a, a famous story, and and Richard Feynman yeah. testifying in front of. Congress kind of demonstrates in a very simple way. He had this amazing ability to demonstrate complicated things in a very simple manner. But um, there, there is a hindsight bias there as well because totally. you know there's also the saying if it ain't fixed, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, which is mostly true. Like all like common sense or common sayings are mostly true. Uh, uh, but you have to know when an anomaly is big enough to register action, and it could be the O-rings. Like looking at it from the outside, I wouldn't know whether O-rings are important or not. So you have to have some sense, you know, like for instance, take, take bridges. Bridges right now are all too old. Like the average bridge was made, to, I'm going to make up numbers, but the average bridge was supposedly made to last 40 years. And the average bridge now, bridge now is like 65 years old. Mm -hmm. So all these bridges are too old. There's probably wear and tear on them, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So how do we know what to how to find the things that, hey, if we don't fix this now, we might have a serious catastrophe on our hands. Right, and I, and I do want to underscore something you said, James, which is, yes, the hindsight bias is definitely at work here uh, in any sort of investigation. These were extraordinarily difficult decisions, and you know, you and I may have made the same decision to launch if we were in these managers' positions. Uh, with that said, though, so even if you're applying the if it ain't broke, don't fix it mantra, there were engineers leading up to the Challenger launch who were saying, who were screaming, this is broken. Six months mm -hmm. before Challenger's launch, an engineer by the name of Roger Bourgelet penned a memo where he said, this is really dangerous. The catastrophe could be of the highest order. I'm talking about the loss of human life. Uh, there were a number of missions where the primary O-ring had failed. There were two of these on each space shuttle for good measure um, on each booster. Because if the primary fails, the secondary kicks in. And the primary had failed, and the secondary had barely saved the day. Um, and he had raised their hand. So I think if you're, if you're say, at a manager, a manager in a company, it, it pays off to listen to your people. The people are actually on the front lines who know what they're doing. You know, in, in this case, it was the, the rocket scientists who were in charge of building the space shuttles and, and, and repairing them. If they're screaming and telling you that something is wrong, it pays off to, I think, listen to them because they have well-trained guts. And if you can pay attention to them and at least investigate, right? Like delay the launch to investigate the problem. And all that the engineers were recommending on the morning of uh, Challenger's launch was 
to delay the launch because the temperatures were really, really cold in Cape Canaveral, uncharacteristically so, and the O-rings had a tendency to turn brittle, which is what Feynman showed. He famously picked up an O-ring and dunked it in ice water on on television during the commission hearings, and and everybody, you know, basically saw the O-ring turn brittle. And so I think it, it pays off to do that, but it turned out that NASA didn't just have an O-ring problem, it had a conformity problem. Um, and you can't dunk conformity into cold water and watch it turn brittle. So another, I think, takeaway from that disaster is to not just attack the first order causes of the problem. Because the technical flaws can be fixed. The managers can be scapegoated, demoted, or fired. But if you're not looking deeper, you're going to miss the deeper cultural pathologies that are going to keep coming up again and again and again. You're going to attack the symptom and not the cause of the problem, or at least you're going to to attack the first order cause of the problem and not the underlying cause because you can't televise a change in NASA's culture of conformity. Like It doesn't make for a sexy stump speech, uh, but firing the responsible people, you know, fixing the technical flaw, that's something you can put on a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but digging deeper and revealing the deeper causes of these accidents. And if you don't do that, by the way, I mean, the technical flaws with the Challenger were fixed, but the cultural flaws were not, which is why Columbia happened 17 years later. Mm -hmm. And Sally Ride, who is a NASA astronaut who served on the commission for both the Challenger and Columbia disasters, she famously said that she could hear the echoes of the Challenger disaster in the Columbia disaster. The technical flaws had been fixed, but the cultural flaws, the underlying deeper cultural flaws were still there. You know, it's, it, it, it's interesting because, you know, you look at, you know, a similar analogy can be made about the 2008 financial crisis. So part of what happened was you had these mathematical models that basically said, you know, U.S. society has never had more than, you know, 1% of homeowners defaulting at any given moment. And so that's why banks and hedge funds were able to do hundred to one leverage. They figured, oh, most of the time I'm gonna make money and every now and then I'll have a, a dip, but not, but it'll survive. And because it won't go beyond 1%. And then, but they didn't, just like NASA on this day, didn't take into account that the coldness was uncharacteristically cold. It would have an effect. Uh, you know, the, the people who made severe investments using these mathematical models didn't take into account that the now there was an unusually large population of subprime borrowers in the in in the current situation in 2006. And so it's a similar thing where you have to sort of figure out what's different and is it important. Exactly. And just because the model described reality 10 years ago doesn't mean that it accurately describes the the reality as it exists today. Like given the different variables so, at work. Yeah. So there's, there's two things. It's like, what's different and is that important? You have to ask mm-hmm. that question. And another one, which is you have to assume every outcome is some sort of equation between planning and luck, yeah. right? So if I have, uh, an, if I do my research and I have an investment that I think is going to work out and then the day I make the announcement, uh, you know, something happens that in the world that seems unrelated, but causes this stock to go up. And then I sell, I can act like I'm a genius, but it was sort of, there was a luck factor in there. Exactly. And we don't, we severely discount the luck factor, right? So when we fail, we attribute it to external factors. And when we succeed, we attribute it to internal factors. We say, oh, we were so, we were so smart. We made the right decisions and we discount the role that luck and opportunity played in the process, which is why I think it, it pays off to ask the same questions after failure and after success. And those questions would be, what went wrong with this failure? And what went right with this failure? And the exact same questions after success. What went right with the success? What went wrong with the success? Right. And that has a way also of focusing your attention on the inputs, on the decisions that went into the to to whatever project you were working on and taking your focus off of the outcome. Because if you're focused too much on the outcome, that can certainly distort the analysis. But looking into the actual decisions that went into it is is a far healthier way because then you know you can learn from the wrong decisions you made and you can retain the right ones. 
You know, uh, it, it's interesting because again, it, a lot of it depends on, on the stakes. So let's say you're trying to get better at chess as an example, uh, one chess game, unless it's like a game for the world championship or whatever is doesn't have really high stakes to it. So it's almost easier to learn from failure because you're so much more focused on like, oh, I should never have made that move. Like that move will appear like will be in nightmares that night in your head. Whereas if you succeed, it's a little unclear if you made any mistake because, hey, I won. I can't really see firsthand what my mistakes were. Maybe I didn't make any. Whereas when you lose, you definitely know you made a mistake. So uh, it's easier to pinpoint what that mistake was. Yeah, exactly. Um, although, I mean, that might be true in the case of in the case of chess, but um, in in other areas, you might. So luck plays a role in failure as well sometimes. Uh, and I don't want to overstate this point, but it is possible for you to do everything right and still fail. So you can design the, you know, the perfect spacecraft to land on Mars, and an unforeseeable dust storm might come along and and basically cripple your state spacecraft and 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 um and what what was i going to say and and completely basically make it crash right um it's possible for you to have the the perfect legal case but a hostile judge or jury could scuttle it um so and, and that doesn't always happen of course but it is possible for that to happen it is rare for luck to to derail it, which is why I think it's just in in whatever it is you're doing, just focus on the inputs. And by the way, I mean part of the reason why, another reason why it it pays off, I think, to focus on the inputs is becoming outcome obsessed is a great way to rob the joy out of anything you do. Um, hmm. You know, in my life, like I I actually I love the process of writing. Uh, a lot of writers sort of complain about it, but like in writing this book, I would say 90% of it was pure just pleasure. I would get up in the morning, I'd spend a few hours working on it, and I just lose sense of self, lose sense of time, where I am in the world. It was beautiful. But the moment I started to think about bestseller lists of sales numbers, mm -hmm. it completely robbed the joy away from from the writing process. Um, so in my life, so that's just another reason if you're not convinced about um, in our discussion of like inputs and, and outputs, if you're not convinced by that, I think it, it just pays off to focus on the process for that reason as well. Because you condition yourself if you feel focus on the inputs to derive pleasure from the process itself, regardless of what happens with the outcome. And, and as long as you're enjoying yourself, like who cares if it led nowhere? Uh, if you enjoy the path, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think that's key because you're never going to know the outcome. You're never going to know if you want the outcome by the time the outcome happens because maybe you get interested in something else along the way. So that's why that's the problem with being too obsessed with the outcome. But, you know, I'm, I want to get back a little bit to th this notion of the outsider mm -hmm. and and how to how to cultivate the skills of the outsider whether or not you're an insider or an outsider. So on the one right. hand, you have someone like Einstein was the old, was at first the ultimate outsider, but then he was the ultimate insider 20 years later when he failed to see kind of the wonders and, and amazing questions that can be asked about quantum right. mechanics. He was almost too much of an insider in his own theories. So like, what could he have done, you think, at that point to cultivate outsider status again? I think one is remaining open-minded, even as you're developing expertise in an, in an area and surrounding yourself with people who are either outsiders, but also who, people who disagree with you, um, who are ready to, to challenge you. Like if you're Andrew Ag Agassi, who's your Pete Sampras? If you are Rocky Balboa, who is your Apollo Creed keeping you on your toes? You need someone like that in your life. And preferably multiple people, basically, who are going to point out the flaws in your thinking. And you need to give them psychological safety to do that. So like when I wrote the book, for example, I gave it to a few trusted friends and I told them, tell me what's wrong with this book. Like, tell me what I'm missing. Tell me what should be taken out. And normally these people may have been reluctant to tell me, you know what, like that subsection in chapter three doesn't really flow well. It's not really well written. I didn't really get it. But when I expressly tell them, tell me what's wrong with this, that gives them safety to come out and say, you know what? Yeah, you should take that out or you should 
clarify what you're talking about here because it made no sense to me, which means it's not going to make sense to thousands of other people either. Um, and so, and then asking yourself too, like if you're not an an insider or if you're not an outsider yourself, if you can't for some reason, I think the easiest way is to actually bring in these people into the conversation. But if you can't do that, it's actually really useful to ask, what would an outsider think? What would a rocket scientist do here? If I was going to be replaced by a new CEO tomorrow, what do you think they would do? Mm, that's a really good question. And that is surprisingly helpful, having that conversation with yourself, creating this like mental model of somebody else, because that provides some distance to whatever problem you're struggling with. Like one of the things that I do in my life when I'm facing a difficult decision is ask myself, what would the 55-year-old or 60-year-old version of me say about this? Like what advice would he give me right now? Mm. And even though it's the same person, like you just have a completely different way of looking at the seemingly important thing I'm struggling with, but then you have some sense of perspective when you're 60 years old. And even that question has been so helpful to me. You know, also it could be, uh, you know, what would the 19-year-old version mm -hmm. of yourself say? Because they, they probably have much more naive questions. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So it can work uh, in both directions. Because, uh, you know, there's that saying, if you can't explain something simply to someone you're teaching, then you don't really understand the concept at all. So you have to kind of explain the question to the 19 year old self and then see what they would say in your mind. I wonder what other questions like, you know, you can ask, uh, you know, what would people who hate me say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or um, so it's worth thinking about some, some questions like that. And then, it, so again, if you're, if that's, if you're an insider, what if, what if I wanted to be a rocket scientist or what if I want to be a doctor and I'm totally an outsider and then, okay, I'll do the prerequisite work. Like I'll read a lot of books. I'll do what Elon Musk did. I'll, I'll read a, a, a ton of, you know, the current books. I'll ask questions about them to the authors. Uh, you know, Elon Musk had that kind of access. Uh, I guess, you know, that is how you become, go, go from outside to a little bit you want to go from being outside to being the outsider in an industry. So at first, everybody's outside anyway, but you're not really the outsider until you know enough to qualify to be around the people in the industry, but you're the outsider. Yeah, exactly. So so like Elon Musk qualified himself by, you know, A, making some money so he has access to all these people, but B, uh, uh, reading a ton of books and then, you know, just creatively he didn't he didn't start asking people from scratch he built up some level of expertise first so he can get in enough to call himself the outsider and i'm just wondering how you would define what's how do you how do you create that level of expertise for yourself without formal training i think you do the work like and as you said elon musk is a great example of this like he just read all these textbooks on a beach in rio um and then when he approached the big players in the industry from traditional aerospace companies who, by the way, were like hating their jobs because <laughs> they were stuck in red tape and endless meetings and they couldn't do what they wanted to do, which is to build rockets. He can go to them and he can be taken seriously. Uh, even though he had these like seemingly crazy ideas, he knew enough to be able to establish some level of credibility with them so that those people wouldn't look at Musk and say, oh, this is just a... Uh, you know, a boy playing with a bunch of bunch of expensive toys, and I want nothing to do with this. Um, they could take him more seriously because he had built up that that foundation. And I think that's a great place to start is to to build some knowledge yourself, and then go talk to go talk to the experts because it's that marrying of like insider and outsider. So again, it's not that expertise isn't valuable; it is. It just experts shouldn't work in isolation. And if someone could come in from the outside, develop some basic level of knowledge, and then bring in that outsider perspective and, and marry it with the insider perspective, that's where the magic happens. This is I, I just love this this concept a lot because like you like you like take Reed Hastings as an example. He wasn't a media executive and yet he created one of the biggest media companies in the world almost overnight. Yeah. And people could have said, you can't. You can't do that. You're just a software guy. How are you? Go what do you know about movies? But he did it. Exactly. 
you know, I, I could honestly talk to you forever about this book. I hope we have you on the podcast again, but I do want to ask about something else you've worked on, which is on the law side. You're, you're this expert in constitutional law. You wrote a book, uh, the, the democratic coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious what you're thinking now. You've written about this concept of, of constitutional stickiness and you know, this, I, uh, I've been wondering about this in this current situation we're in that if you look back at a, a big U S crisis, like the civil war, civil war was fought obviously over slavery, but on a more nuanced level, both the South and the North thought that they were acting according to the constitution and they were interpreting the constitution slightly differently and acting accordingly. And I'm just wondering, have we gotten so, 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 so they still had the constitution in mind when they were making all of their big de decisions, Lincoln did, Jefferson Davis did, and so on. I'm curious what, if we've gotten too far from the constitution and our current thinking. So that doesn't really motivate government's decisions at all. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, cause, cause like in, in a simple example, and again, I'm not arguing for anything one way or the other, but like arresting people for not wearing a mask or arresting people for opening their business when, when the original federalists, you know, really, and even before that, the reason they wrote the articles of confederation, even before that was to focus government's role on property rights. And again, not, it's not, it's not the Bible. It wasn't given to us by God. So we could change. That's the whole purpose is we could change rules that, that don't work anymore. And I'm just, but I'm just wondering, like, have we gotten far from the constitution? Are we kind of working our way around it constantly? Does a constitution need to be redone in some way? So the thing about the US constitution is that it says so little. It's by far the shortest constitution in the world. Um, and you know, when I teach, I, constitutional law is one of the classes I teach. The constitution appears at the very end in an appendix of like a 1200 page textbook. Because the words it uses are so vague, like due process, right. equal protection. And people, and as you said, right, you know, both sides of the Civil War could cite the Constitution as a justification for what they were doing. It's so malleable and so open to interpretation that you can find justifications if you want to um, for what you're trying to achieve, which is why you see politicians on both sides of the of the aisle citing the same provisions as justification for very different things that they're trying to achieve. Um, and right. so, so I think that's, we're just seeing a manifestation of that, right? So there's, you know, there are people who are, who are saying that, well, no, what basically that the constitution says nothing about what state governments can do when it comes to a crisis like this and governors have the power to tell you to remain in your house or force you to wear a face mask if, if, if they think it's in the interest of public health and safety. And then there are other people who are saying that, no, that's an infringement on, on individual rights, on your right to due process, not being able to operate a business. And so you have these competing perspectives based on the very same wording, uh, which is, you know, one of the reasons why I think constitutional law is, is so fun, because going back to our discussion from earlier, it's so uncertain. There are so many unknowns. And, and depending mm. on the perspective you take, and it's easy to shift perspectives here, you can come up with, with very different results based on the same language, which is why like before a, an important Supreme Court decision, people are sitting on the edge of their seats because they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know how these nine people are, are going to rule. And what we're seeing is a manifestation well, of that. And, and by the way, the Supreme Court, there's nothing mentioned in the Constitution that the Supreme Court has any effect on the Constitution. So the Supreme Court could rule, obviously it's it's a precedent since, since John Marshall, but the Supreme Court could rule that a law is unconstitutional. That's not in the constitution that they could do that. They sort of just took that power. That's right, yeah. Which is which is fine. We all agreed to it and we still agree to it, but it's interesting how, you know, the constitution sort of became this living document where it's very unclear what what are the president's rights with executive orders? What are the state's rights when the constitution hasn't specifically specified something? Do the states take over from there? It's uh like if you were to change one right from the bill of rights, or reword it in some way. Is there any that you would change? Mm. That's a great question. Um, Other than the right for bears to have arms, <laughs> for bears to have arms. <laughs> uh, you know, I. 
I don't know. I, I think because a lot of the rights in, and like I'm thinking about the First Amendment, for example. Um, if anything, you know, I would I would strengthen some of the First Amendment protections. I think that's the as I was like going through the list of, of of the Bill of Rights, that's the first one that popped to mind because it's number one on the on the list. I think freedom of speech is such a a crucial right. And it's very much, I think, underappreciated in in modern society. We found ourselves now in a, in a position where controversial speakers are being shut down and shouted out in in college campuses. I've seen this firsthand happen at the law school where I teach, uh, yeah. and I think it's a really, really dangerous trend to limit speech in that fashion because um, it's that free marketplace of ideas, that's how the truth emerges. And if you're completely remaining your, in your echo chamber and shutting yourself to ideas from, from the other side, that's why tribalism develops. That's why we have these deep disconnects in society. And I think that's why the search for the truth suffers as well, because you're so stuck in your own perspective that, that you're unwilling to engage with the other side. Uh, and part of it is because right. of like social media and algorithms and all of that. But the other part of it is like it's just become too easy for us to unsubscribe, unfriend, unfollow people that we disagree with. Right. So on the one hand, there's this very human thing going on. Like I, I, I could be narrow minded and not listen to somebody I don't agree with. Uh, and you can argue freedom of speech should be allowed in all circumstances, but a, a university or a, a social media platform are private entities and they're allowed to decide, you know, the flip art, the inverted argument is they're allowed to, a private entity is allowed to decide, you know, who's going to, shit on the floor in their living room. Sure. And uh they and that's that's where this freedom of speech becomes complicated uh you know inside a private space. No, absolutely. So yeah, so the first amendment applies to to state actors or public entities. Uh but but I do think even if even as private actors are are making decisions about who to allow uh in terms of speaking, um in terms of the the flow of information coming in, it's important to keep those principles in mind because when you're when the classroom discussion is so one-sided when the information that's being circulated on a university campus is so one-sided i think you end up whether you're on a private university or a public university you end up doing a disservice to your students because you're not there you're not exposing them to the other side of the argument um, and it's just, you know going right. back to what we were talking about before right if you're not exposed to the arguments on the other side you're not going to be able to see their perspective if you can't see their perspective you're going to rely on straw man arguments and if you rely on straw man arguments you're not going to be able to change people's minds you're not going to be able to do your job properly as an attorney or as a business business person too that that search for truth that single mindedness affects us far more than we give it credit for. So I, I, I a hundred percent agree with you, but then there's a difference between what's the law and what are principles. Sure. Yep. So I, so I could say, I'm going to live by these principles. I'm going to allow people to say anything they want in front of me and, and consider it, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I wonder if what is needed is a, you know, but then again, the flip side is there's some important, there are some semi-public you know, platforms or spaces like a university is, is you could almost view it as semi-public. It's not, you're not inside someone's home. You're in a place where people are learning to go out into the world to, to make the world a better place. Social media platform is a private company, right. you know, invented for profits. Uh, but you know, it's, 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 it's messages that everybody uses to convey an opinion from their fingers to the outside world. And so I wonder if there's a different definition somehow of, of semi-public where, where freedom of speech. So the, the real first amendment just basically says, I can't prosecute you and throw you in jail for something you say, you know, with, with some small outliers for hate speech and so on. But, uh, uh, all these, all these universities or social media platforms are, are essentially, you know, judging and punishing and sentencing people in one way or the other for saying things they don't agree with. And maybe it should be viewed though as a semi-public and the first amendment should apply to them. 
but then that feels unconstitutional. Yeah, I don't know. so that's right. I mean, so the text of the First Amendment and the, the way it's been interpreted, it only applies to public entities. But what we were talking about was certainly applied to public universities. Um, but I think I, I wanted to zoom out a little bit out of the Constitution and speak more broadly about this issue because I, I do think it's a big problem. And I, and I do think it, it is at the heart of so much of the political turmoil and disconnect we're, we're experiencing these days is, is the lack of the, the lack of the ability to see somebody else's truth, to look at the world from their perspective. Um, because you know if someone, if someone doesn't believe what you believe, it's not because they're stupid. It's not because you're right and they're wrong. It's because they believe something you don't believe. They see something that you're not seeing. And you're not going to be able to engage with that person. You're not going to be able to even begin to change that person's mind unless you know the underlying facts, unless you know the reasons for, for why they believe what they believe. So much of the public discourse is completely devoid of nuance. I mean, arguments have now become a way of signaling to our own tribe that we belong as opposed to an attempt to meaningfully engage with the other side, right? It's abortion is murder or my body, my choice. And the arguments are being made increasingly louder and louder. They're intended to convey to our tribe that we are a member of that tribe, uh, not to engage with the other side. And, and I think a lot is lost because of that process. There is no du- nuance anymore in public debate. And, and I think a good starting point would be to introduce our students, our children from early ages to, to facts on the opposite side. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Well, uh, Ozan Varal, uh, author of Think Like a Rocket Scientist. Again, I feel like I could have talked to you about so many more things in, in, in your book. We've been talking for a while. I don't want to take up more of your time, but Think Like a Rocket Scientist, such a great book. It really does describe how to think like a rocket scientist, but you do it in the context of all these amazing stories of, of very successful people and interesting things in, in history. And plus your own background going from, from rocket science and Mars rovers to constitutional law and writing about democratic coups. It's, it's, it's so fascinating. Maybe the next time you come on, we'll talk more about the constitution and how to, I got to read your book about, about the, the, the democratic coup. So uh, I'll do that and we'll, we'll have you on again, but I really appreciate the time. And, and, and again, I highly recommend the book. Also, uh, you can go to, uh, I'll spell your name, ozonvaral.com's website, O-Z-N-V-A-R-O-O-L.com. You've got a great blog. You've got, uh, all the, all this stuff to add to the material in the book, even just for the blog alone. It's fascinating. You always raise uh, interesting questions in your blog. So once again, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, James. This was such a fun conversation. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. At FedEx Office, we know that for small businesses, the holidays can be stressful. But we're here with the holiday cheer and expertise you need to help get your to-do list done. Need to create that? Our online design tool has got you covered. Pack and ship these? Just come in store and we'll take it from there. Print those? How does same day turnaround sound? This season, let us help you slay the holidays with the products, services, tools, and timelines that will make your business bright. Create more happy for the holidays at office.fedex.com.